Hi, I'm Warren Geller. At Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish Community, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, the North Ward Center, and by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. Promotional support provided by Jaffe Communications, where business, media, and government converge in New Jersey. And by JerseyBites.com. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome one-on-one -on -one here at the Tisch WNET studio in the heart of New York City Lincoln Center. We're pleased to welcome for the first time Chris Giamo, Executive Vice President, Head of the Commercial Bank at TD Bank. How you doing? I'm good, Steve. We're doing this around the holidays, 2017. Uh, commercial banking, describe it. Does it mean business banking? Yeah, it's business banking. I mean, essentially the commercial bank is all the commercial lending activities at TD Bank, as well as our corporate product and services area, which would be treasury management, deposit products, et cetera, and some specialty businesses that we run as well. Mm. Describe the, quote, state of commercial banking in this region, because you, have, you cover New Jersey, you got New York, we, we got a big audience on Long Island as well. Describe what's going on. Well, you know, the metropolitan area, I mean, New York's the financial capital of the world. So it's a desired market for every financial institution. So it's, uh, it's a crowded marketplace. It's a wealthy marketplace, but it's also crowded, so it's highly competitive. Um, you know, this is a resilient economy in this Fine, region. Man. Well, I think it's slower to fall into a recession and maybe quicker to come out. And there is a lot of resiliency. I mean, New Yorkers, New Jerseyans are uh, tough people, and, uh, mm. and they find a way to make it through any type of crisis. Where'd you grow up? North Jersey, not too far, right on the other side of the George Washington Bridge. It's interesting, as Jersey guys who uh, do business in New York, in this region, <coughs> what about your background and how you grew up prepared you to be in this top level position in this incredibly competitive business? Loaded question, I know. Yeah, you know, and there's probably a lot of answers to it, but I think anyone who comes from this area knows it's a pretty quick pace. And uh, while people are very thoughtful, they're also not so thoughtful in some ways. So you got to find your own way. And I think <coughs> uh, hard work, effort, and making it happen are things, traits that you need to have that you can kind of carry into the workplace for sure. In terms of uh, knowing and understanding business or businesses, most businesses, from your experience, Chris, looking for when it comes to a bank that they're going to choose? What are they looking for? Well, you know, I, I think you need that customer service, no matter what it is. And we know on the consumer side, that's critically important. Seven days a week. But it's as important on the business side. And sometimes I don't know that business owners necessarily fully know what they're looking for, but when they receive it, they like it. And that's where you get the loyalty. And I think What's more, the it, though? I think it's... Um, the advice side of things. I think the if you- trusted advisor piece? If yeah. You, I like to call it that. Well, we do too. And I think if you look at many small to medium sized businesses, they don't have a board of directors. They don't have a lot of resources. And one great valuable resource they have is their banker. Mm. And that advice is free in a lot of ways. And you know, one thing we see when we engage with our clients and dig into their business and have a better understanding for what their longer term outlook is, we could provide a lot of value. A couple things, by the way, I want to disclose two things. One, you happen to be my bank over on the Jersey side. Well, we're happy to know that. You could have called it stores. <laughs> That's it's right. It's a store. I'm not even going to say where. 
And also TD happens to be a major underwriter of public broadcasting and our programming to fully disclose that. The other piece that I've learned about your bank is that there's a charitable piece. Talk about that and, and where those dollars go and why it matters. Well, you know, I think if we look at what we're about, we, we say brand, model, and culture. Brand, model, and culture. Right. And I think the culture piece is a commitment to make the communities in which we work and live a better place. And part of what we do with the foundation is the monetary part, where we give a lot of monetary support to important um, not-for-profits and organizations and issues like affordable housing throughout all the communities that we're in. I think the part that differentiates us a bit is the volunteerism piece. We encourage our employees to get actively involved How do you do that? in those charities. And How I think get that message out? it's back part of the culture of who we are. I think it's a little bit leading by example. Interestingly, just recently, there were two events local. I know that, that you know, the, the show broadcast We're seen in many states, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, et cetera. We had um, in Long Island recently, Island Harvest Food Bank. What does it say it again? Give Island it Harvest Food Bank. A nonprofit. A not for profit. What do they do? We supported over 12,000 meals to be distributed. So we just didn't write the check for that. We had our employees help package those meals and distribute those meals. We did another event right around Veterans Day, a benefit concert to actually benefit homeless veterans in the area. Mm -hmm. Sad to know that we even have homeless veterans in our area. Absolutely. And we raise money for essential needs in conjunction, again, with a VA hospital and a local not-for-profit for boots, socks, underwear, just essential things that local veterans would need. And I personally was involved in uh, serving some of those meals and distributing those goods. And that's the type of lead by example. And people rally around that. And our employees love it. It's interesting. Uh, before I let you out here, as a student of leadership, as you know, um, I, I ask this question of certain leaders who come in here. Um, my book, Lessons, I'm not going to plug it, but my book, Lessons in Leadership, you'll see a whole section in there where if I've asked people as a broadcaster in public broadcasting this question, two sides of it. Number one, Chris, what would you say the number one leadership lesson you have learned in your career professionally has been? Uh, it's tough to say the first. I, I, I'll say this. Out? An important trait in leadership, if you don't have pride in yourself and in what you do, it's hard to have people to follow you. And, you know, I think that pride factor is when you do the right thing, lead by example, and then you try and find people around your team that have those same traits. Because I think in any industry, you're going to have the technical skill. Otherwise, you're not at the table. It's those qualitative traits that you need to perform well and, more importantly, to lead people. The other side of it, biggest challenge you face. Is it comparable to the same thing you just said? Biggest challenge you face as a leader? Yeah, you know, it's always hard to make everybody happy and to lead a large, large organization in a competitive environment. And mixing that qualitative piece and the quantitative piece are very difficult. And that's always a challenge to bring together. You love what you do? I do. Because? Uh, I, I, I love our organization. I think it's a great place. And I think it, uh, for what it stands for and what, what it actually does in the community and the service we provide. And I, and I like growing. And we're a growth company. So we're always moving forward, and that's what excites me. Finally, Chris, before I let you describe the, your market responsibilities, where are you for the whole operation? Yeah, well, TD is on the East Coast primarily, 14 states, so I have the footprint-wide responsibility All for the commercial states. link. Yes. A lot of traveling. A lot of traveling, but it's good to be in New York. Well, we are right here in the heart of New York City in Lincoln Center at the Tisch WNET studio where a lot of great programming take place, takes place. And we're pleased to welcome for the first time Chris Giamo, Executive Vice President, Head of the Commercial Bank at TD Bank. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Steve. All the best during the holidays. We're you really too. excited during the holidays. We'll be right back on one-on-one -on -one right after this. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato coming to you from Rowan University. In fact, more specifically, we are in a center called the Virtual Reality Center at Rowan University, and we'll be doing a series of in-depth interviews with a whole range of people who are making a difference in applied research. And we start off our series with Dr. Ali A. Hushman, who is the president of Rowan University. Good to see you, Mr. President. Good to see you as well. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, we also want to make it clear that we have a group of students here at Rowan who uh, are learning about uh, broadcasting interviewing skills. It's an applied mm -hmm. teaching class as well that I happen to be teaching here at Rowan at the time to fully disclose. 
Applied research, what does it mean and connect it to this center? Well, it means that this center is available to all the entities within our community, not only our faculty and our students, but also the businesses, the enterprises, the communities like the municipalities, like the hospitals, like mm. doctors across the river. People who want to do the kind of experimentation that is intrusive, so to speak. They, and let's assume that you want to cut somebody's open. Yes. In order to kind of try some new method. You cannot do that. You cannot afford to just cut somebody just to see whether things work or not. But if you have virtual reality. But if you have virtual reality, you can do that in 100 different times and eventually find the kind of solution that you think applies and then take it to the real world and implement it. You take that example and apply it to every aspect that you want, whether it's controlling floods, whether it's controlling population, whether it's designing new traffic system, whether it's flying uh, new aircrafts and how landing and safe. And Excuse me, interrupting to be safer in our very crowded airways. Exactly. You know, why is that the role of a public university? Well, the public university belongs to the public, and that we are here to create knowledge and to impart knowledge. So when we create knowledge, the knowledge, in my view, belongs to our community, to our society. Mm. And we need to give it to them in a way that they can use it to make the lives of people better. That's really what universities are all about, in my view. You know, this is the virtual reality center here at Rowan. And what's interesting is that when we were getting ready, Dr. Ushman, for today, one of the things that struck me, and I remember the first time I came through here, I'm thinking Sandy, 2012. Exactly. Hurricane Sandy, Storm Sandy, that everyone knows, Super Storm Sandy. How could virtual reality and what's going on here help municipalities prepare for another storm and make decisions accordingly? Well, uh, the, experience, the, the experiences that we have acquired from Sandy, all the data and all the information, and other similar events could be fed into a system in here with very intelligent creative people who now can develop a model and then apply it to different scenarios. By changing certain parameters and certain, certain numbers, they could probably see different conditions that could occur and then account for them and plan for them. So whether it's going to be a massive storm that is going to bring surge or wind or thunderstorm, all sorts of eventualities can be simulated in here. And so for every different condition you could really have or develop a solution, at least in the, in the laboratory setting. Mm. And then when things happen, then at least you have solutions out there in your back pocket that you could implement. I think that's really what- it, It's interesting because while there's a research component, there's a public policy component because public policy decisions, if, I'm, if I have this right, can be made based on the simulation and the information you get. Yes, it could. If, if the simulation is done right by people who can model them accurately, the simulation can almost depict the reality. The beauty of the simulation and this kind of thing is that it, this kind of results should be done by people who understand the data, who understand modeling, who can truly simulate the real reality. Nothing is worse than you trying to depict an issue or, or, or a situation mm. that is divorced from reality and try to simulate that. That's why I'm saying that it's very, very important that the kind of information that we get, the kind of data that we get are so accurate, and the modeling, that it, modeling is done so accurate so that when you now have a model, that model truly represents the various conditions of the reality. Did you envision this 10, five years ago? Did In you this kind it? of condition, no, at this level, no. Obviously, simulation, I did, I did simulation in my own dissertation 30 years ago. But so I, you understand simulation? Oh, of course, absolutely. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, so we, we know how to, how to simulate various conditions. Uh, I actually looked at a very, very high-powered lathe cutting machine that cuts parts, and I use simulation in here to look at various conditions under which the cutting tool could be damaged or worn or cracked. So people do simulation in all sorts of uh, settings. Let's talk healthcare. Uh, one of the interviews we'll be doing here at the Virtual Reality Center at Rowan is, um, is actually with someone who does brain surgery. You know, so think about it. There's technology, and by the way, we'll show as much video as we can to make this as real as possible. But doctor, we're talking about surgeons dealing with the brain and the intricacies of that organ. And seeing things based on technology and science and virtual reality before they would go in, mm -hmm. he or she would go in and do surgery. Why does that matter so much? <laughs> Life. What is more important than that? I mean, you're talking about such a complex uh, surgery by very brilliant individuals. Still, they, things could go wrong. And for them to have access 
to all the information in the brain of a patient before they go in mm. and do the cutting, that gives them much more no information and knowledge to do it correctly, to do it accurately, especially, and you're gonna to talk to one of the, as you said, one of the surgeons, a brilliant man in here, who's gonna come and He's actually here, you. there's yes, a whole group course. of people to, uh, to sitting in on our conversation right now. Go ahead, talk about and, it. And so the, you, you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna find out from him that how, how, how valuable this tool is for him to go in with open eyes. Because when you're looking at the brain of a patient, and I, I know there are a whole host of techniques and MRIs and, and, and scans and all of that, but it's still the complexity of this thing is so monumental that any additional information that the surgeon has in order to do their job right is that much better for the safety of the patient. Talk about the students. Whether they're medical students, because I know there's a collaboration sure. with the medical school mm -hmm. down here, mm -hmm. uh, the folks I believe at Cooper. That's right. But for students, I mean, I talked about the fact that we have students who are studying media and communication interviewing skills. What about for students who are studying medicine, who are studying aviation, who are studying topography, land use? Journalism. Right now, you're actually doing simulation in here for these, for these people. They are seeing a version of an interview. I never even looked at it that way. I am looking. That's, that, that's what is happening right now. But the technology the tech that we're talking about here makes it even, is, is it a different te teaching experience? And if so, how? It is much different because visualization, many, many people learn by visualizing, by seeing things as it happens. Not just talking about Not it. Not just talking about it because it's abstract. Many, some people like that. Some people actually learn from basic principles, but many people like to be visual, visual learners. So when they see something that is in motion and is moving and they can see different parts and they can see, for example, the way you can fly through a human body and see different parts and different components of body, that is such an amazing way of mm -hmm. learning things. Then, then any amount of reading and abstract is not going to en enable you to, to, to learn as much. My final question, Doctor. Uh, you were featured in a major business publication not too far back as an entrepreneur and innovator. They call it Disruptor, right? Uh, disru disru disrupt disruptor. Was that okay with you? I, I, I'm, I, I don't know, I don't know, I guess, I guess anything that, anybody who's willing to disrupt a, a, a status quo that is not functioning well, I think I would, I would consider as a positive thing. Is that part of what this is, uh, the virtual reality center? Well, or a different create, way of look, looking trying at Trying to create a university that teaches people real practical education that makes their lives better. To me, it's very important. If you want to send your son or daughter to school and you write a big check today and they say, go to university X, Y, Z and get whatever degree, your hope as a parent is that your child eventually finishes, becomes a successful, productive citizen and has a decent life, has a job, has, 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 has a purpose in life. Mm -hmm. If you bring people in here to this university to teach them to give them a degree, at the end of the day, they need to be armed with some knowledge, some techniques, some capabilities that they can go out there and they can sell their knowledge and their capabilities and have a, uh, uh, you know, earning and have a decent life. That's, that's the vision of every single parent that I know of. That's the point. That's the point. The whole purpose of education is to make people more capable to function better and be more successful. What else is more important than that? Well said, uh, Dr. Ali Hushman, who's the president here at Rome University. Um, I am, again, to disclose, I'm proud to be teaching here, um, but also Rowan has been a, and continues to be a big supporter of public broadcasting. And I want to thank you for allowing us to come on campus and to be part of this fascinating experiment. Thank you. Thank and you, thank Dr. you for being here, and thank you for really lending your expertise to our students, because the kind of knowledge that you bring, the kind of real practical knowledge that you bring in here is invaluable to these students. Thank when you. They see it. Thank you for your help. We'll be right back after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at steveadubato. Welcome to our Help for Our Heroes series. We're shooting on location at the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. We are pleased to be joined by J. Michael Armstrong, Chief Executive Officer of an organization called Community Hope, which does, Michael? 
We provide uh, housing uh, for the mental, uh, for veterans. We do both residential, uh, we do both transitional and permanent housing. We also do the SSVF program. Which what does that mean? The SSVF program is supported services for veterans' families, and it's a program designed to help veterans and their families either avoid homelessness or if they become homeless, get rapidly rehousing. And we provide that service in 15 counties in New Jersey and uh, 13 in Pennsylvania. Michael, why do so many veterans and their families find themselves dealing, struggling with housing issues? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. I think that, um, um, you know, the lack of preparation. I mean, there was a, was a study recently done of individuals leaving the Department of Defense, leaving active duty, and they found that only 40 percent were prepared, had job opportunities, or had a job waiting for them when they come back. And I think that the families, uh, when everybody, when a veteran comes back, there's a honeymoon period. Everybody's excited about their return, and they don't think about those things. And you've got, um, here in Jersey, you've got a couple of things. I mean, you've got the lack of preparation for employment. You've got the high cost of living and the high cost of housing. And then you've got uh, the issues, the post-traumatic stress disorder and all the other issues that veterans uh, encounter uh, once the honeymoon period's over. Let's talk services. The series is also intended, largely intended, to talk about outreach, how veterans can reach out, get that help, and also how some organizations are reaching out to veterans to connect with them. A veteran, family member of a veteran right now watching saying, we don't know what we're going to do. We're concerned about where we're going to live. They're potentially homeless. Right. Who do they reach out for? Uh, they would call us. We have a 1-800 number, and we would help them identify do they need transitional housing, do they need permanent housing. Your number's housing. up right now as you speak. Go right. Ahead. Thank you. And we, whether what kind of housing they need and what kind of support we can provide. And if we can't provide it, we would, uh, you know, refer them to one of the other uh, great group of people that are gathered here today. We've got a lot of good services here in Jersey. Not enough, but we have some... Uh, and I do have some great services here. By the way, Michael's making reference to really a terrific group of people. Um, we have gathered 12 experts, advocates, government officials, others who care deeply, people from the foundation community as well, who care deeply about helping our heroes, not just the rhetoric that often goes on about, you know, we, we thank you for your service, which by the way, I always ask this question, I'm gonna ask of you, do most veterans appreciate that expression, we thank you for our service, A and B, why is it not nearly enough? Uh, I think that they do appreciate it. But again, I think there are so many needs uh, when they come back that, uh, you know, that's uh, nice, but their need for employment, there's a need for housing, there's a need often for counseling, assistance with their families, often need for assistance with legal services. Why uh, go to legal services? Legal services, I mean, a lot of the people we see in our housing program are individuals who've got mental illness or addiction. And so there are a lot of issues with um, outstanding warrants, motor vehicular offenses. Uh, sometimes they're in arrear in child support. Uh, they don't have proper identification. There are a lot of things that need to be uh, taken care of before they can get back into the uh, workforce. And so we have a consortium that we put together with Merck and Lowenstein Sandler. Lowenstein Sandler, a prominent law firm. Uh, right. And why, why would Merck be involved? Uh, because they have a, a, a large law firm also, and uh, we've connected with them. We have a, a great relationship with the pharmaceutical industry, and they've volunteered to uh, provide the funding and provide their attorneys. So as I say, we have Merck, uh, Lowenstein Sandler, Northwest Legal Services uh, that uh, help with the individuals we have in residence and our other services to um, take care of these issues so they can get back in their workforce. Mm -hmm. They, um, you know, can do what they need why to do. Why do you do this? Why do I do this? Yeah, why do you do it? Um, well, I do it. I'm a veteran. I was a, a Vietnam era veteran. And for me, it's a, a great uh, change from, and I was in the, the service in the early 70s. At that point, if you were in the military, you were a pariah. You know, people couldn't differentiate between the war and the veterans. Being against the war and being against uh, veterans. Uh, exactly. Now, at this point, we've come a long way in society. We can realize that you may not uh, believe in the war, but you can certainly appreciate the uh, sacrifices that veterans are making. And their families. Uh, and their families. Yes, so I think that's a, a tremendous change, but um, that's one of the reasons I do it. Yeah. It's partly personal for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Final question. Yes. Anyone watching us right now in this series that you'll see these interviews throughout all of our platforms at the Caucus Educational Corporation and our partners in public broadcasting and files, 
and our digital platforms, but anyone watching right now who wants to be helpful, mm -hmm. other than simply saying to a veteran, we thank you for your service, your service, what could and should they do? Well, I think if they see someone in need, they should, um, uh, you know, speak with them about it. I mean, it's often tough to do, but I think they should uh, point out the fact that there are services. There's a lot of assistance available. You know, the, the statistic of 20 veterans a day committing suicide, the reality is a significant number of those are people who aren't involved with veteran services. And so if we get more people involved in veteran services, you know, uh, have access to the services that are available, I think we can cut that number dramatically. Dramatically. But um, I think to let people know there is help available, that uh, to not avoid dealing with it. I mean, most of us want to tread lightly, but sometimes you have to, in the most delicate, diplomatic, loving way, let people know you got a problem, there's some help available. Michael, we thank you for our sir, your service to our country, but we also thank you for the work you do every day on behalf of the veterans who need it. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Steve. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Northward Center, and by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I cry when I'm hungry because it's really hurtful to my stomach. Feel sad that you don't have food like at the table. I feel weird because my tummy starts grumbling. Sometimes all that makes you feel better is food.